Hello, everybody. Han Sung here uh, to talk about career advice and technology, kind of a vlog series. So um, getting back to the thumbnail that you saw here. So whenever you see the green border, that means uh, it's going to be more like a podcast, talking about things, etc. If you are here for the TCP course, this is the border and thumbnail that you would see. Okay, And you can see that um, anything with a blue border means it's the actual TCP packet analysis content itself, so tune in for that. If there are enough questions for follow-up, I'll make a detailed Q&A session, and that'll have an orange background. I talked about this in my um, previous video on packet analysis, but I'll, I'll do this for a couple more sessions so that everybody gets used to it. When you see a green one like this, it means we're talking about industry advice, etc. So, last week, or two weeks before, uh, the career advice video was cut very abruptly, right? I talked about uh, the CCI lab and then boom, game over. It was because I don't want these sessions to last too long. Um, 15 minutes at most, I think is a good number, 15, 20 minutes at most. So I'll try to keep it to that length. So getting back to the CCI lab, it, yes, it's a hard certification, but it's not the holy grail. It's not the end all be all. Um, someone asked me, hey, how hard is CCIE? Now, keep in mind, this is a two-day lab that I talked about. Things have changed. Now it's one day. And I'm okay with a one day because I thought the troubleshooting scenarios were a little bit contrived. I don't know that there were real-world examples. There were more kind of gotcha, you know, stupid things that no, you would hardly ever see in the real world. So I thought, I thought it was kind of a waste of time. The first half day was setting up IP addresses. Who, who, who can't do that, right? If you can't do that... You shouldn't be sitting for the lab, certainly. So if you take those two things away, it does come down to one day uh, worth of test. However, when I took it the first time, I actually failed. And I know why I failed. I was freaked out about it. I let the moment uh, overtake me. And it started when I showed up at the door. I showed up at the door. There was uh, 10 of us waiting, I think it was. And we were just, you know, hey, how you doing? How you doing? The proctor opens the door and says, oh, John and Jimmy, uh, you guys are in. The rest of you didn't make it to day two. Have a nice life. We'll debrief you later. And then they said, oh, you four, you're new. Come over here. So I think eight people failed. Two went on. So I guess they had 10 or maybe it was six and two. I'm not sure. But point being, the vast majority failed and didn't advance to day two. So I went, oh, man, this sucks. So I was already kind of psyched out. I was already excited, and I let the moment consume me. So when I was starting to configure things and it wasn't working, I didn't take my own advice of systematically troubleshooting that scenario. And so what happened? I ran out of time. And, and while I made it to day two, uh, I didn't progress uh, after that. Okay? I was so upset at myself that I came back and I refreshed that CCIE scheduling site. I'm not even kidding. Every 30 minutes. Because people drop out, right? They, they drop out in and out. So I was, I can still picture myself sitting in Long Island City building uh, of Citigroup and just keeping refresh, 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 refresh. And sh sure enough, something opened up a week later. So I signed up immediately. So after I failed the first one, two weeks later, I rescheduled it. And I went and told my boss, uh, John, at the time, hey, John, I need you know, a couple of days off. I'm going to retake the CCI. And he says, um, I don't think you can take retake it that fast. And I was like, what are you talking about? They let me, the system let me do it. And them, oh, okay. So I signed up for it. I showed up, took the test, and I didn't let it consume me because I knew what I was up against. And I, I passed with flying colors. In fact, my proctor told me, when we got to the the troubleshooting session, he said after lunch, day two after lunch, he said that was the final thing left. He gave me kind of a talk and said, hey, Hansang, now that you're a CCIE, don't find those stupid problems. Try to find the real problems related to routing and whatnot. And I thought, wait, I'm sorry, what did you just say? And he said, you know you have enough points to advance. Just represent yourself in troubleshooting. And I was the happiest person alive. Conversely, the person that was with me who made it to day two was struggling. It was struggling, struggling, struggling. And at the end, 
Um, he might have gotten some extra time because this was his fifth attempt. And I don't know. I don't know that I would attempt something for the, f you know, five times because fundamentally I must be doing something wrong, right? So I, I, I would have taken a different attack plan. Like, what am I doing wrong that I failed a test five times? Am I not studying right? Am I not doing things? So anyway, I thought there was some self analysis missing uh, from that person. But I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he passed or not. But but getting back to the story, on day one, when I was setting up BGP, my route reflectors weren't working. It wasn't coming up. And I couldn't. I didn't understand why until I troubleshot. And the person behind me used my route reflector by mistake, because you have kind of, you know, you're, you're assigned by row and column, what server and IP your route reflector is you, you're supposed to use. He used mine and he kept overriding my configs. And obviously it was set up for his and mine didn't work. I called the proctor and say, listen, my config is good. I know it's good, but this guy screwed up and overwrote my stuff. He looked at it and he said, yeah, you're right. Uh, but I can see your config. It looks good. Move on. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I said, uh, can you make a note on my test paper and sign saying that you checked it out? And he said, no, no, I'll be here tomorrow. I said, I know, but, you know, no offense, but one in a million, if you somehow can't, then the new proctor won't know. I'm sure every student says, oh, yeah, but it's right. And somebody else screwed up, right? In this case, it actually was that case. So he wrote saying, you know, Hansung's configs are okay. Co-student overrode his and whatnot. But it again, it didn't rattle me because I knew my stuff was good. And it was correctly configured. And then the he, he gave me that pep talk after lunch saying, you're a CCI now. Make sure you troubleshoot the good stuff and not the, the you know, gimmicky stuff. And I did. And he gave me that posted note with my four-digit number. And I was very happy. And um, people always say that you're never as sharp as the day you leave the lab after you get your number. And it's true. That's you know, we have other things to do. And you start to lose it. But because you built up such a solid foundation, it takes a long time before all of that goes away. I don't know if it's ever will go away. In fact, I still remember the address space that they gave me during the lab to slice it up. I can actually recreate the entire scenario on a piece of paper. And so, you know, the point here is that it's hard, but it's about getting back to the original question that I never asked answered, how hard is it? Think about 18 credit hours of sophomore level engineering workload, and you're taking the finals in one day. So 18 credit hours of sophomore level uh, engineering workload, all of that whole entire semester, everything, all 18 hours, you take the uh, final on one day. That's about the equivalent workload. Not impossible, but not easy either. Okay. So that's kind of the CCI story. Now, the, the other part of this is certification versus not certification. It's the age old debate. Is it worth it? Is it not worth it? Um, and here's the thing. It can't hurt you to have it. In fact, don't take certification for certification's sake, with the exception that when you submit your resume, your CV, the HR person can't understand the jargon that you may be using or what you even wrote in the CV or resume, but they do know what CCIE and all their certifications are, right? So they have a checklist of things. And nowadays with OCR, I'm sure it's, you know, pre-processed before even a human looks at it. So for that sake, it's good to have a certification. And I'll tell you a story. I was interviewing uh, for an operations position. I was helping to interview for operations team and i have a standard question that i ask i always you sh oh you should always have a standard question you shouldn't do it off the cuff because it's not fair sometimes you ask hard questions sometimes you ask easy questions always use the same question so that everybody's abilities can be tested using a common uh, data point and he passed but he was struggling quite a bit he was struggling with the foundational concepts as opposed to how do you do xyz and he admitted to me, he was nervous wreck, and he said, Han Sang, I know I'm a CCIE, but I don't have any practical experience. I did it because I needed a career change. I studied my ass off, and I came from kind of a mainframe background. I saw the world changing. 
studied and became a CCIE, but zero practical experience. And I recommended him for hire, not because he told me that, because he showed commitment, he showed progress by jumping ship and taking on a pretty hard certification track and studied well enough to understand the concepts. And I've, I've told this to everybody that I hired. I can teach you technical things. I can't teach you ethics, work ethic, morals, good, good, you know, don't be a jerk, right? That rule. So study hard and pass the test because it'll help you open the doors from an HR perspective. The other thing is don't ever try to BS your way through a technical checkout because the other person will know. Okay. And the last thing you want to come off is, is you're on that bubble of making and not making it. And they cut you off because you try to bluster your way through technology. I never understood this. If someone asks you a technical question, there's a technical answer. So if they ask, they of course must know the answer. So why would you try to bluff your way through that? So don't do that. Admit right away, I don't know that. Uh, or say, you know, that's actually just um, rote memorization stuff. I memorized it once. I don't have it now, but it's on Google. I can find it in 10 seconds. Why don't we talk about the concepts behind that? You can take it that approach if you do understand it. And then the other one is, you know, I talked about in the first session, how do you get more? I said volunteer, right? So do volunteer because it's practice that makes you good. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book. I think it was Malcolm Gladwell that it took 10,000 hours of training to become good okay, at anything, whether it's professional sports and whatnot. And if I go back to my career and I think back, 10,000 hours is about right. The amount of time you have to invest to be really, really good at it. So again, going back to that, you know, be 100% committed or go work elsewhere that I talked about in the first session, make sure you're committed because this is an ever-changing field, right? We in technology live in dog years. Because the advancement of technology is so fast, every year is like we're seven years in just about any other field. If you're a carpenter, which I, don't, I wouldn't mind being because I love woodworking, but if you're a framer, the, the way to frame a house changes over time. Now there's passive house versus, you know, there's house wraps. There are zip systems and flashing systems that change. But if you look at the last 20 years, it's not radical change. Whereas in technology, 20 years ago versus now, you wouldn't even be able to understand the concepts of what we do today from back then. So um, make sure you read voraciously that I, like I talked about, volunteer and get that 10,000 hours in somehow. What, even if it's studying, it's okay because if you have that knowledge, the baseline knowledge, then you can apply it uh, once you get that opportunity and you can show it off during your interview. And I, I, meant, I think I mentioned this in my pr previous video, your toolbox and certification courses and schools are teaching you how to use the tool. Okay, and your job is to collect those tools and put it in your toolbox because at some point you're going to use it. And so that's my advice to you is get the certification, help open HR doors, be confident in your interview, but don't try to BS your way through that. Okay, so the other story that I'll tell you is, you know, people start out with help desk and they sometimes move up, right? Help desk to maybe systems engineering servers and desktops to maybe network uh, engineering and, and, and whatnot. And packet analysis is helpful in all throughout the case. And you might think, ah, oh, you can't do that. You can't really start off from help desk and move up. So I'll give you proof positive that's possible. I was working on a project where it was for senior executives, very, very senior executives of city. And I wanted to do a site visit because it's, it's not too far from where I live. And I did. And the, the project manager said, hey, Hansung, would you mind if so-and-so tagged along because he, he's on the help desk helping the execs and it would be good for him to see the physical location and no issues. So he came and we got to talking and he was studying. He knew how routing and switching work, but not in any detail. He understood the, the concepts of it. And this one, I was able to configure bulk of it offline because, you know, just layer two switching and simple routing. So while I had to change control and everything else, I kind of cut and pasted it before and before I turned it over to operations who would then check it to make sure it was part of the, made sure that it was per the change control. And I said, hey, 
do you want to try it? Because I explained to him what it is I was doing, why, you know, why I was typing these commands and what it means and how this spanning tree and this other things and how they work and, you know, and kind of a 10,000 foot view. And he kind of grasped it, grasped it and asked the next logical cogent question. And I knew then that he had that ESP, the technology ESP that I talk about. He was inquisitive. He was smart. He wanted to learn. And maybe, was it two years later? I got an email because he still worked at City. He emailed me with his number. Good for him. And then he went on to get yet another number. So I think I had four people that, I'm not saying I tutor them, but I inspire is the wrong word. I introduced them to what's out there in the world of CCIE and all four became CCIEs. Okay, so it's it's doable. I wouldn't be sitting here telling you this if I thought it was an impossible thing to climb. CCIEs, you, that may not be the thing for you. That's okay because there's security track now and it's easier to break in now because people expect you to be specialists. The, the demand for, you know, generalist at a very high level is not there. They understand that there's too much to know, so they try to pick somebody who's a specialist. So pick security, pick networking. Packet analysis sits on top of both network and actually all three, right? Application, but very few application people have the wherewithal to understand the networking. But the reverse is true. Network people tend to understand ge generically how applications work. But packet analysis is kind of that unifying theme that sits on top of all the silos. So make sure you get some practice in. When you're sitting around airports, airplanes, that's a great time to get packet capture because airports are very, very congested from an air spectrum perspective. Airplane, high, high latency. So you're getting a very different view of what abnormal packet trace looks like. So do that. Get your 10,000 hours in. Okay, so I think I'll wrap up for today because we're almost approaching 15 minutes. Don't forget, though, that keep an eye out for these types of thumbnails. I'll mention it one more time. Green is what we're doing today, which is advice. Orange is Q&A. And blue is actually, the Wireshark blue is actually for TCP IP traces. And those eagle-eyed people might know that my shirt color matches a thumbnail, right? How about that? So... Um, so much for not being fashionable. With that, I'll leave it to you. The next session I'll talk about is probably the major fails that I've had in my professional career. I mean, catastrophic failures that I can laugh at now, but back then it was pretty brutal. And Aaron, in one of my videos, actually commented on saying, hey, Hansang, it was great working with you. He was the, uh, the not a benefactor, but the what would be the word? Not victim either, but more victim than benefactor of my claim and the fail. And I'll explain what that abject total failure was and the circumstances behind it because it's humorous. And I hope you get a chuckle out of that. So we'll talk about that next time. Major fails. And if you have some ideas and if you've had some major fails, make sure you subscribe and comment so that we can all learn from that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Take care, guys.